Chipotle, who's in LA. God, as she's far away from us, that she would still be a representation of you and a representation of Park Press. Lord, we're thankful that you have been a God who said, come to you for all that we need, but also been a God who says, this is in addition how you can come to me. So we pray together saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Well, as I mentioned, I'm Benjamin. It's good to be with you. Uh, I was a pastor for 20 years, and we moved here from the East Coast from my wife's job at uh, First Press Berkeley. Uh, she was there for a while, and uh, there was not another church in the area for me to become a pastor at, so I started my own company, um, painting and contracting. So as I mentioned before, it's a pleasure to be working for you. We're one of the vendors of the church for odd jobs here and there, and then, then big jobs. So I have a small company of 15 guys, and we do painting and contracting. I love to bike and surf and do business co uh, coaching and consulting with churches for, for growth and vibrancy and health. So it's wonderful to be with you all. We're back in Samuel. I know that uh, Calvin did a great job starting off the first half of Samuel, or not the whole book, but the first, the first half of the story with David and Bathsheba. And today is the second story, or the second half of the story with David and Bathsheba, or, or God's kind of saying, hey, wake up, we've got some things to talk about. It's a long passage. I'm going to read from, um, as it might be in your bulletin, I'm going to read from an excerpt at the very end of chapter 11, and we'll go into 12. It's probably a very familiar passage for many of us. If you're new here today, welcome. If you have absolutely no idea about the Bible or God, we're glad that you're here. Uh, hopefully something will land with you if you have questions at the end about what church is or what the Bible's talking about or what I'm talking about, myself or Shane or Paula will be at the end of the service and can connect with you or, or pray for you for anything you need. All right, we are in chapter 11 at the very, very end, chapter 11, verse 26. This is just on the heels of um, David murdering Uriah and taking um, Bathsheba and then God coming to him and saying, we've got some stuff to talk about. So 11, 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was to loathe one of his own flock of herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and she shall, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to, the, to David, You are that man, and thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the whole house of Israel and the house of Judah, and that had been too little. Excuse me, had that been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the Lord shall never depart from your house, excuse me, the, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, 
And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. I'm going to read 14. Nevertheless, because of this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord, and the child that is born to you shall die. Amen. That is the word of the Lord. And again, thank you, Shane. And again, if you're new to the church, or if this passage is new to you, some of the things in that story can be difficult. They can be challenging on the front end, and then you hear about God being scorned or God punishing, uh, and we hear in the New Testament all about God's forgiveness, so sometimes it can feel like there's a little bit of tension there. So we're going to talk about the challenging part, then we're going to talk about the good part. As I mentioned, uh, Calvin did the first half of the story last week, and he talked a bit about the risk of isolation. Does anybody remember that? The risks of isolation, whether you're, you're poor and isolated, or like David, whether you're powerful and isolated. And there's risks for living a life in isolation. The sermon title today is called Collateral Damage. It's sort of the, the collateral damage, not sort of, it's actual, the collateral damage of living in isolation, the collateral damage of our sin, uh, the collateral damage of doing whatever we want to do, and how that ricochets and ripples and just leaks out onto other people. However, at the very end of the story, there's kind of what I call the, the but God. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. There's like the hardship of life, the challenges of life, the traumas of life, but God. There's David and Bathsheba and Uriah, but God, right? There's always but God. And if there's any saving component of the whole Bible, it's the history of all the stuff that has happened, but God. And I hope that can land with you. We're going to talk about sin, but not so much to land on just the subject of sin, because I know that doesn't land with us, especially uh, in the East Bay, right? We don't want to talk about sin. We don't want to admit sin. We don't want to kind of agree that sin is out there, but the reality is it is out there. So I want to talk about sin, not for the sake of sin, but to talk about how good God is, because on the flip side of sin is always the but God. But we don't know how amazing God is unless we recognize some of the lack of amazingness in us. Does that make sense? All right, so let's start here. Have any of us ever done something, and this is an easy one, this is the cookies on the bottom shelf here. Has anyone ever done something that's hurt somebody else? If you don't raise your hand, we're just all liars, right? How about this? Have you ever thought something or said something that hurt others? Yeah, me too. Like, these are all what we call sins of commission or, or actions. If we don't like the word sin, we'll just say actions, right? The actions of commission, things we've committed. David is no stranger to that. I am no stranger. How about kind of the flip side of the coin? Have you ever not done something and that resulted in someone being hurt? We mentioned something about that in, in our confession, right? Lord, forgive us for the things we have have not done, I forget the exact language, forgive us for the things we have not done, and that's resulted in other damage, right? We've not done acts of justice, not done acts of mercy or care, or, or how about this, you've, you've not forgiven someone, and that's hurt you, and it's also hurt someone else. So again, how many of us have ever done something that's hurt somebody? And we could all say amen to that, or, or whatever the phrase, like, I have. I think that we, we don't want to say the word amen because that means and so let it be done. We don't want to keep hurting people, right? So forget the amen there. And then we've also not done things that have hurt others. So we've got sins of commission and sins of omission. Maybe you can be thinking of those things as we talk about the collateral damage of what we've done. Uh, how many of us have been or are parents or grandparents? I myself, I have two kids, 1917. Have you ever, have you done something to them or raised them in a way that has negative, lasting effects? And they're in counseling now. <laughs> Maybe they're counselors. Uh, or, or, or we've just loved them in such an amazing way. When you, you look at them, you're like, Lord, thank you for the fingerprint on their life, and they're doing well. 
right? The challenging thing is some of us as parents, we could be amazing parents and they could still end up in juvenile detention, right? Or we could be amazing in parents and they just land and they're doing great. Like we've just been a way that has collateral damage or has lasting effects. Um, I want to talk about willpower and collateral damage for a moment. Uh, so on Tuesday, I had collateral damage. Not as intense as, as David, but I guess sin is sin, so it was pretty significant collateral damage. Tuesday morning, by 9.32 a.m., I get up at 5 a.m. almost every day, work out, pray, and start the business with my guys and start traveling to do estimates. By 9.32, I was completely out of willpower. I was at the Starbucks in Montclair, and I was sitting there. I had finally, I had been in San Francisco, I had been in Richmond, I had been in El Cerrito, and I'm finally back in Oakland thinking, ah, I can chill out, I can type all of these estimates. And then I'm at Starbucks eating some banana bread or whatever it is, and I just start getting all these interruptions on my cell phone. It's more estimates, which is great. Uh, tile products are not in stock. Paint's not in stock. We've got a challenge at one of our job sites. I'm like, oh, I just want to sit here and be calm and work on the estimates. And I'm hungry, right? I didn't sleep well the night before. I had an exercise that morning, and I didn't have second breakfast. And I'm like, holy cow, just get off my back. And so my willpower was completely gone. If you've ever kind of studied willpower or you, you're like, you know, I just have a lot of discipline, and then the gas is empty, the tank is empty, um, you know, un sometimes unbeknownst to us, we have a limited amount of willpower. And once it's gone, it's gone. And you either replenish it or you take it out on others. Anybody been there before? You're just out of kindness, you're out of patience, you're out of love, and look out. You're kind of accidentally breaking out a can on people. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. The, I was just leaking, the lack of my willpower starting to leak out on others and having collateral damage on other people. I was rude, I was impatient, I was selfish, I was not opening doors for people because I was so self-centered, like I was causing collateral damage on other people because I was working and living in isolation, not taking care of myself, and everybody else was suffering because of my sin. Does that make sense? I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but sometimes we just run out of resources to give other people, and it stopped me in my tracks. So I had to pump the brakes, I had to reboot, I had to restart my day, I had to drink a little bit of salt and glucose because that helps your frontal cortex with willpower. I had to take a walk and just start it all over again. But I had still hurt people. I hadn't killed Uriah, I hadn't had an affair, but I was still hurting people. And I wonder if any of us are there. I wonder if you can kind of resonate. I wonder if you can pause today, put yourself in the story and say, I had collateral damage on other people this week. And I've got to reconcile, or I've got to forgive, or God's got to forgive me. Because we're in this story. If we just read this for what it is, it's not going to impact our life. It's not going to mean anything other than black and white, two-dimensional words. So what's the collateral damage you caused last week, or this morning? For years, we fought in the car on the way to church, right? You've been there too. What's the collateral damage you caused last week? What's the collateral damage you can avoid, af avoid this coming week? So there's some pain in this story. A lot of pain in the story. I want to just, just kind of dive back into the pain so that we can experience the but God. The but God in communion, not B-U-T-T, -T, but B-U-T. The but God in communion and the, B, uh, the but God tomorrow when you're at the office and the but God next Saturday when you're worn out or starting your weekend. So there's a lot of pain that's been caused by one person's collateral damage. I wonder if you need to be forgiven today for some collateral damage. Let's look at this. Verse 11, chapter 11, verse 26. I don't know if you've got a Bible there in front of you. It's on page 285. Bathsheba made lamentation. Her husband, she's just found out her husband has died. Anybody here lost a child a brother, a sister, a husband. Man, like there's a lot of loss. Like we just read over this. Like her husband died and she lamented. Lamentation or lamenting is shaking. 
It's grieving, it's wailing. If you ever look up the Hebrew meaning of lamentation in, on, on Google or a Hebrew a dictionary, whatever it might be called, like it means intense, intense emotional, emotional exasperation. She's not just going to counseling and saying, you know what, my husband died last week, I'm ready to move on. She has been beat up, bruised, and her, her life is wrecked. And the next thing we know, she, David calls and says, hey, I'm emailing you, come to my house. Like, there's no, there, you know, we don't know if she wanted to go. She don't, we don't know if she went against her will. Like, when David had sex with her, there's a chance it was against her will, and she did it because that's what women did. She, he's the king. She's not going to say no to the king. So not only has she lost her husband, a loved one, she's now with a brand new man for the rest of her life. We, we don't fully know what that's like. But go to the next piece of pain here. Chapter 12, verse 1. It displeased the Lord. So not only has David hurt Bathsheba, the Lord is grieving. We don't know how much, we can't anthropomorphize too much onto God and say, well, we know how much God hurts. But the word displeased means God is grieving. So Bathsheba is wailing. God is grieving. And then you bump down to the story Nathan shares in verse 2, 12, 2. The poor man had nothing. Have you ever been hungry? Have you ever not been able to pay a bill? Have you ever been, ever been jogging or running or walking and you're just done? Like this poor man had nothing. So we have a third character in the story. It's an illustration, but the third person is hurt. And he's got a precious little sheep, a precious child, a precious grandchild. The lamb would eat with them at the dinner table. The lamb would drink out of a cup. The lamb was like the guy's daughter. Any parents have daughters here? We've got little Ruth in, in the building. We've got a couple other parents. Like, come on. You love your daughter. Like, you will whip out mama or papa bear on anybody that hurts your daughter. You will go to prison voluntarily to protect your daughter. And we've got a daughter here, a lamb that's referenced as the guy's daughter, damaged. Jump all the way down to verse 11. Excuse me, 10, chapter 12, verse 11. The sword shall never depart from your house. That means Israel is going to be at war. A lot of male soldiers are going to lose their lives. A lot of wives are going to lose their husbands because of one man's deeds. Have you ever caused collateral damage and a ripple effect across other people's lives? Your family, your neighborhood, your extended family, and employees or bosses here, any employers? Like there are times when I hurt my whole team because of a bad estimate. And I'm getting on them to finish the job on time. And I'm impatient because of my lack of planning. Like we have a ripple effect on other people's lives because of mistakes we made, things we say, actions we've had, the way we've lived our lives. I mean, sometimes we are parents and bosses leaving out the baggage of our past life. There's collateral damage and a ripple effect on people around us when we don't have our stuff together. And it leaks all, all out on everybody, and it hurts them. David's selfish, thoughtless, self-centered actions have a ripple effect on an entire kingdom. One man injuring an entire kingdom. Now, we might not have that power and that effect, but part of our lives can really hurt others. What I'm trying to do is help us understand that we can be a David, we can cause collateral damage, and we really, really need help. I'm trying to help us understand that our footprint is in this story as well. So there's good news here. And I know I want to wrap up because we've got communion coming. David's life is a wreck. He's going to lose his son. The whole country is going to suffer damage because of him. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your spouse, your partner, your children... Your employees, they're going to experience damage from you. And we've got to look in the mirror and say, what am I causing? But here's the challenge. Our collateral damage hurts others and hurts us but God. If you're here today reeling from pain, reeling from guilt, reeling from shame, from whatever it was you did or you're doing today, there's a but God for you. 
If you have sin and guilt and shame, there's a but God for you, right? We've hurt others, but we're also hurting ourselves. Jump over to chapter 12, verse, what is it? Verse 13. Nathan says this amazing phrase, and this has to land with you. This has to land with you so that you can live with it. Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. He just killed a man. He had an affair with someone. He's now got an illegitimate, illegitimate child. He's going to hurt his whole kingdom. Like for a second, just look in the mirror. What is it that you have done that you feel darkness from, guilt from, shame from, pain from? What are you in counseling right now from because of something you did or someone did to you? And God says this, the Lord has put away your sin. This is the but God, right? Look in the mirror. When you drive to work tomorrow, you go home today, you're going you're gonna to sin the second or the, the, the hour after you leave this building. But you've got to remember that God says, I've put away your sin. Nevertheless, I'm putting it all away. When I went to college, I had a serious problem with self-image. I had a serious identity crisis. I was lying to people about who I was. I was making up stories of things I didn't do so that I would be liked and appreciated. I was a people pleaser. Huge chips on my shoulder of my, my parents and the way I lived through high school. I was a wreck. I needed to know that there was a but God. I needed to know that I had value and identity in Christ and not just myself. David needed to know that he had value in, not, in God and not just killing Uriah. You need to know that you've got value and identity in God despite how you treat your ch children, despite how you treat your employees, despite what you think or you look like in the mirror. God views you very, very differently than we view ourselves. He says, nevertheless, God's going to put away your sin. There's nothing we can do to cause God to love us less. Let me say that again. There's nothing, there's no performance, there's no deed we can do to cause God to love us less. But if you're a person who's all about performance and looking good and achievement, there's also nothing you can do to cause God to love you more. Right? We can't do and win God over. It's not enough to remember that we can't cause God to punish us. We can't cause God to love us more, right? There's just this intense but God. So I don't know who you are today or, or what you've done or what you're bringing to the, the table. I don't know what you're bringing to the story. I don't know what your story is, but there's a but God for you. You can't possibly be as bad as David. And maybe that's not the right thing to say. You know, sin is sin. So our thoughts and our actions, they're equally as bad as what David did. But come on. David's a man after God's own heart. You're a woman after God's own heart, no matter who you are or what you did. Friends, I want to encourage you that no matter what collateral damage you have caused, what you're going to do this coming week, because you will do something. God says, the Lord has put away your sin. Let me end with the good news. There's one more piece of pain in this story. David has to lose his son. The son is the sacrifice for all of what David did. It's poor, sort of a horrible ending. But if you jump to the New Testament, it's the best ending. Right? Because God's saying, I'm putting all your sin away, but a son's got to die. Someone's got to really absorb everything you've ever done. And so it's God's son, the metaphor, the illustration, the, the bridge is that Jesus, the table, Jesus has got to die. And it's a weird way of good news, but it's really, really good news. So when you leave here today, you got to leave your chip here. You've got to leave your baggage here in the sanctuary. You've got to leave all your mess at the table. It just can't go with you. If you take it with you, you're saying the son wasn't enough. God doesn't love me enough. God's not good enough. The cross wasn't big enough. The shadow of the cross, there's no way it could cover me. But the son died. The son in this story died to save David, and the son of Jesus, son of God, dies to save us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we remember how 
Brian is in the hospital and, and you're the healer. We, we remember how little baby Esther, Lord, fragile and completely out of control, Lord, that you're the God, the, the doctor, the healer. You, you're not only the doctor and the God of them, you're the, you're the Savior, you're Jesus, you're the son of us here. Lord, we are the collateral damage that puts you on the cross. But thank you for putting your son in our place to absorb it. God, I pray a blessing on these people here today that they would recognize all of the stuff they're leaking out on other people, all the hurt and damage they're causing, but also all the burdens they're holding on to. And Lord Jesus, would you please free and set, set them free today? Would they look in the mirror and say, I'm a child of God? Your son jumped on the cross and stayed there and healed me, and all my collateral damage can disappear. Amen. I love the table. It's a reminder of, of, of God saying, I, I want to marry you. I am marrying you. I've got you in my hand. I've got you in my lap. I don't ever want to lose you, and you're never going to lose me. No matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus says, I've got you. When Jesus was with the disciples in the upper room, the last dinner, he wanted to make sure they got it. So he said that the previous commandments were not enough. The law, the duties, the rules, they're, they're just not enough. So I need to break my body, I need to pour out my blood and show you a brand new covenant, a brand new promise. Right? The Ten Commandments, they pointed us to the need for grace. But the bread and wine point us straight at Jesus who just gave us all the grace we ever needed. He said the old commandment, the old covenant is not enough. So a new covenant I give you. A covenant of my body, a covenant of my blood, not rules, not regulation, and not perfection. He took a bread, a loaf of bread from the table, and he said, Disciples, this is my body broken and beat up for you, so that you wouldn't have to be broken and beat up. And as much as we might metaphorically or emotionally cut ourselves and bleed ourselves, Jesus says it's never going to be enough. Your rules, your regulations, all the blood and sweat and your tears you put out there to try and save you, they're never going to be enough. So he gave us a new covenant, a covenant of his blood shed for us. And Paul reminds us that whenever we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim to ourselves and we proclaim to the whole world the forgiveness of our sins. Not once, not twice, but forever. Let's pray. God, we're reminded that you're good, and man, we need a daily reminder, sometimes a moment-by-moment moment reminder that you're good. Would you please remind us of the collateral damage that we've hurt ourselves with and others, not so that we could be heavy laden with it, but so that we would see the but God of you saving it, saving us, cleaning us, making our burden light. In Jesus' name, Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paula, could you please come up and help? Sorry, whoever has to wash that. As I mentioned, friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. After you receive, would you please wait for us all to eat and drink together? You can come forward. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you.
Christ, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Well, friends, take, eat, take and eat all of it. out of order. Let's share what it is we believe and then go into the song. Christians, in whom do you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you're able to, let's stand and sing. Thanks for being patient with me being out of order. Let us break bread together. Friends, let's close with our song, Trust and Obey. It's helpful as you sing these songs to actually believe them. As we go into this week not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow morning, may you rely on the God who's got your front, your sides, and your back.
May the grace of Christ, which daily renews us, and the love of God, which enables us to love all, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, which, which unites us in one body, make us eager to obey the will of God until we meet again. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, as you go out this week to be freed people, to live as free people. May you be comforted by the love of the Father. May you know that you are already set free by Jesus on the cross. You have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit living in you and around you to equip you to have less collateral damage on others and live as free people. Amen. <laughs>